For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. He promised us that he would be a counselor, a mighty God and a prince of peace. He promised us that he would be a father and would love us with a love that would not see. found his promises are true. He is everything he said that he would be. The finest words I know could not begin to tell just how much Jesus really Wonderful than my mind can conceive. He's more wonderful than my heart can believe. He goes beyond my highest hopes and fondest dreams. He's everything that my soul ever longed for everything he's promised and so much more more than amazing more than marvelous more than miraculous could ever be he's more than wonderful that's what Jesus is to me. I stand amazed to think the King of glory would come to live within the heart of us. I marvel just to know he really loves me when I think of who he is and who I am. For he's more wonderful than my mind can conceive. He's more wonderful than my heart can believe. He goes beyond my highest hopes and fondest dreams. He's everything that my soul ever longed for, everything he's promised, and so much more, more than amazing, more than marvelous, more than miraculous could ever be. He's more than wonderful. That's what Jesus is to me. He's everything, He's everything that my soul ever longed for. Everything He's promised and so much more more than amazing more than amazing more than marvelous, yes that's what jesus is more than miraculous, that's what my savior is more he's more than wonderful more than wonderful that's what jesus is that's what Jesus is. Jesus, more than wonderful to me. He's more to
Thank you, friends. That was wonderful. <laughs> well, good morning. As Calvin said, my name is Catherine. I am a campus minister with InterVarsity, so I serve college students as a pastor to them at St. Mary's College over just through the tunnel um, up in Moraga, and they're lovely and also college students, so it's great to be with you all today um, and have a little bit of a change of pace in my life. Uh, last time I was here, I told you some stories of my farm animals, and I'm sorry to disappoint Chris, but there won't be as many of those today, but I do promise a few stories of my students. Um, but as we go in, let's read the word together. I'll give room for a couple deep breaths before I pray. Creator God, you are big and you are awesome. And yet you see each one of us and you are with us as we gather. God, be with us today. Would you speak to us through your word and be with us in this place and as we go from. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, this morning's reading is from 2 Samuel chapter 7. So if you'll turn to your Bibles and follow along with me, we'll read verse 1 through 14. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See, now I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about all among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, who I am commanded to shepherd my people of Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and be disturbed no more, and evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly. Thus, from the time that I appointed judges for my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will punish him with a rod such as mortals use with blows inflicted by human beings. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right. I know you've been studying Samuel for a while together. So I'm going to ask you, pop quiz, because I'm assuming that you know just a few things. Who are some of the major characters we've met so far in the book of Samuel? Who, who's, who's been going around? Saul? Yes, Saul, king right before we've got David, right? Saul, David, and then who came at the very beginning? Samuel, look at that. We're such smart people here today. All right, book of Samuel, we've got book one, book two, and you've journeyed through, you've seen Samuel the prophet, you've seen Saul the first king, who turns out to be not a great king, and then we have David right? All three of them come from humble origins. All three of them are given authority by God, and all three of them have kind of different stories. And our friend David, so far, has had a pretty good story, right? 
He, we have David and Goliath. We have him coming and being anointed out as a shepherd to become king. We even see that when Saul dies, he grieves this man who has oppressed him and has tried to murder him. David is a man after God's heart. And so when we read this passage, it's easy for us to get confused. Because when I read that he notices that there's this injustice, that he is living in this beautiful home, and that God is living in a tent. I'm like, yeah, that makes total sense to me. I too would say, why are we putting God out in the dusty tent in the middle of the town when we spent all this time building this beautiful place and he, God should be revered, right? God should have a place to dwell that is more than just this tent and tabernacle. And so to me, when I first read this passage, I'm confused. Because David proposes this idea. Nathan, a prophet, a friend, says, that makes sense to me. The Lord is with you. Like, go for it, man. Like, this is a good idea. And it's not a bad idea. Right? It seems like a good idea. And then the next... 10 verses, God spends a lot of time saying no. Right? He says no to this great and wonderful seeming idea. And the question is, why? And what's God doing? So if you're taking notes today, the title of our sermon is When God Says No. And this passage reminded me of a time when my plans and God's plans didn't exactly align, all right? As we were starting to come out of COVID and start to see each other in person again, I was working as a campus minister on the college campus, and I was like, you know what? I need to gather some people, right? So I was like, I'm going to plan a Bible study for some students, and I, we're going to meet outside. That'll be good. And I'm going to intentionally invite a bunch of freshmen because they don't know what college ministry is supposed to look like. And I want to invest in them because they're going to be the future of our chapter, right? Unlike a church like this, where some of you have been here for tens, twenties of years, right? I get my students for four years, maybe five, if things don't go as they plan, right? And so investing in these freshmen seemed like a great idea. And I had all these plans, and if you had asked any of like the top ministry strategists, they probably would have been like, yeah, this seems like a good plan. And so I set out, and I hosted this Bible study outside, and the first week, no one showed up. Just, you know, okay, that's fine. You know, I need to tell some more people. Second week, one student shows up. Third week, that same one student shows up. Fourth week, I'm like, okay, what is going on here? Because I thought I was supposed to gather the people. I thought that this was the plan. And I realized that in all my planning, I had forgotten to pray. And I prayed about it because I was like, well, maybe I need to go back to the drawing board. Maybe I need to do something else. And God said, no, stay there, right? Invest in this one student. And this student, she was shy. She wore her mask around all of campus, not just as like a precaution, but also as a barrier, because she didn't want anyone too close to her. She was anxious. She was really worried. She had just come into college. She didn't know how to make friends. And I would literally host a Bible study with her where we'd like read a passage, and I would ask her, so what do you think? And she would just stand there and stare at me, like the whole time. I, there were multiple times she came, she didn't speak a word other than hello. It's like, I don't know why she's here. I don't know what she's getting out of this, right? And so God said no to my initial big vision dream plans, right? Of having like a dozen freshmen that were super on fire. But he had something better planned. And in David's case, God says no. And he says no to something that is still good, right? The thing is, is that David's intuition is not completely off. 
and his heart is still good. His heart is longing after God, but he is forgetting about God's will. Like me, David didn't pray about this decision before he made it, including Nathan, right? Nathan didn't even hear from God until after. He said, you know what? You know God. You know Jesus, right? Like, you've got it. You've got it, man. But David forgets to check in with what God's will is. And this is one of the biggest traps that we have as Christians, is to settle and think that we have it all figured out. Right? To say, oh, you know what? I was saved when I was 16. I know Jesus. I know what God's heart is. I've got this. Right? I know. I don't need to rely on God anymore because I relied on God that one time. Right? Because we like to have control. We like to have it all figured out. We like to be in charge of our story. And if I've learned anything from pastoring college students, is it's that we love easy answers. One of the biggest things that college students ask me is they ask me about sin and they ask me where the line is, right? They're like, okay, so if I go on three dates with this person, can I hold their hand? I'm like, I... Is there anywhere in the scripture that, like, tells me, like, okay, and then on date number five, you can do this, right? Or when you're doing this, like, we want a rule book. We want a rule book of sin that just, like, lines things out. And we would love to be able to just check off all the boxes and say, I'm a good Christian. I've got it figured out, right? I was just in Serbia serving on a mission trip helping some college students get just a vision for what God's global kingdom is. And one of the biggest questions that I got from people who are considering Jesus, considering following him for the first time, was what I thought was kind of silly. They would ask me, well, if I follow Jesus, do I have to give up smoking? It's like, well, in here there's nothing that, like, lines out The moment that you follow Jesus, you need to give up your nicotine addiction, right? But also, God calls us out of addiction into better life. And so sin is not just this thing that's about rules. And I think it's easy for us to get caught up in, let me figure it out, let me know the rules, let me follow the plan, right? Let me keep with the play. But sin is something that separates us from God. So this idea that we can just follow our heart, you know, you do you, follow your heart, live your dreams, takes us away from remembering what God's heart is. And that God's heart is to be with us. And so we don't just get to check in once and then forget about him. Right? And David learns this the hard way because his heart isn't bad, but he's not relying on God. And many people see this point as actually the turning point in David's story. From being a king who loves and seeks after God to being a king who starts seeking after his own will. And I'll let you go down that journey as you keep going but I'm sure that I wouldn't be spoiling it for anyone to say that some things go wrong. But the thing is, is that when God says no, he's not just saying no because he's a parent that wants to create a bunch of rules, right? And they make no sense to us, and he just wants to say no because he has power. That's not why God says no. When God says no, he has something better. And when God said no to me, having my dream of these, like, 12 first-year students, what I didn't realize is that in investing in this one student, I would invest in one of my greatest future leaders. A student who, just by happenstance, I learned the other day, was actually one of Calvin's middle school youth students a long time ago. And a student who 
now is one of my best leaders because in spending that time with me, she felt that she could trust me. And so then when I invited her to go to a conference and when she encountered God and when she made a decision to follow Jesus again in her adult life, she wanted all her friends to know. And so she started the next year a small group for freshmen. And her small group, unlike my small group, had dozens of students. And this year, I have over seven students who came out of that small group that she has discipled, who are excited to be on campus this fall, who are dreaming and planning of how they're going to reach their peers. Because when God said no, it turned out he had a better plan. And for David, his no has a purpose. For one, we learn that David is not the best choice to build this temple. Uh, if you look to 1 Chronicles 22, in verse 7, we get the same story in 1 Chronicles 22, and then also in 1 Chronicles 17, where we learn about God giving this covenant to David. And David is talking to Solomon, his son later, about why he didn't build the temple. And in verse 7, he said, My son, I had planned to build a house to the name of the Lord, my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, You have shed much blood and waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name, because you have shed so much blood in my sight on the earth. See, a son shall be born to you. He shall be a man of peace. And then in verse 10, it says, He will build a house for my name. Right? God has a plan. He knows that he can't just build this whole thing around one fallible human. And so he brings up Solomon to be a man of peace, and so that his temple may be built under peace, not war. But also God sees David's heart, and he pours out this blessing on him. Before this, we have no kings in Israel who have had a successor. Right? We had Saul, and Saul tried to have a successor, tried to have his son step up, and we all saw how that worked out. Right? It ended in bloodshed. And so for God to promise a successor is a big deal. But this promise is actually not even just about Solomon, which I think is totally rad, if I may be a bit of a Gen Zer. All right. Flip with me to Luke chapter 1. Verse 32, when we learn about the birth of Jesus, he will be great and he will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. We go back to where we just were in 2 Samuel 7, verse 13. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. See, God's not just planning for the here and now. He's not just planning for the temple in Jerusalem to be built He's not just planning for Solomon. God's planning for Jesus. And God's planning for the world. Because in giving up the tabernacle, God's actually giving up something that's been really important to the formation of the Israelites. That their God travels with them. That their God does not abandon them because of their physical location. That their God is not limited to one specific place. But that God is with them. And God in Jesus opens his temple to us. That the Holy Spirit indwells in us. And that God does not just live within the walls of this church, as I'm sure we all know. But that God dwells in our world. So when God said no, he had something better. And the thing is, is that this happens to us all the time, right? We get, like, so locked in our brains about what it has to look like. We have these expectations 
of what God's going to do, what God's going to say, what we think is best. But when we lay down those plans, God had so much better. Right? We remember David not as the king who made mistakes, but we remember him as the king who is faithful. Right? That's how he's referred to as we go into the New Testament. We remember him as the lineage of Jesus. And so God takes David's desire for this like thing that seems just and that seems right. And he says, no, I have something better for you. This spring, I encountered probably one of the hardest times in my ministry, just the, one of the hardest situations to work through. I had a prayer walk scheduled on my campus, which is when I gather some of my local church partners and we wander around with students and we pray for things that we see. And we meet in front of the campus chapel, right? Great place to join. So I had this scheduled. And the night before, some students chose to occupy the chapel and protest for Palestine. And so now I have some of my students in my ministry who are currently on hunger strike. I have some students who are not even in my ministry who have never stepped foot in a church who are seeing my students who are on hunger strike asking why they are praying. I have others of my students who are standing outside the doors of the chapel who are gathering and saying, this is not right, this is not just, this is not how God's house should be used. I am angry because they are disrespecting God. I have a student who is Palestinian. I have a student whose family is Jewish. And here I am, and I'm supposed to lead a prayer walk. I'm supposed to gather all these people and say, let's pray for campus, right? And I could have taken the easy way route. I could have said, okay, let's start there and then we'll just wander around campus everywhere but here, don't look, right? But instead we entered into the tension. I thought about canceling, right? I was like, I don't know, God, like, is this what you want? And God was like, no, you need to pray. And I experienced as a result one of the most beautiful moments where one of those students who was outside protesting the protest and a student who is inside, who's not Christian, but has been trying to figure out what she believes about God. And some of my church partners went inside and we prayed together a written prayer of lament. And we joined with the people saying, our hearts are broken at injustice our hearts are broken at death. Not saying, oh, God takes this political side, God takes this political side. Right? Not saying these people who are inside or these people who are outside are right. But saying, we as Christians must join together beyond those barriers that we hold. And we prayed, and it was this moment in this chapel when this man had come in trying to just cause disruption. And so he came in and he's screaming at these protesters in the corner. And we're on the opposite side and we're praying. And we're praying and we're praying. And we're just going through, right? And I am so nervous that my body is physically shaking as I'm just holding on to this liturgy, saying, I believe in a God who is bigger than all of this. There's a student who practices the organ because he's in the music program and he starts playing the organ louder and louder and louder just to try to drown out the noise because he's just trying to go to class and I think he's just annoyed right I don't know what side he's on he's just annoyed so it's just getting louder and we're praying in this corner and as we're praying to hear each other we get louder right we started off really quiet and kind of meek right as you go okay God Da, 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 right? But we started getting louder. And at some point, this man who's annoyed and who's been yelling runs out of breath and he walks away. And the organist finishes his song. And all that's left 
in the vacuum of space is our prayers. Our prayers which are now bolder than we had planned them to be. As we prayed, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. And afterwards, I stepped out of that chapel and I talked to one of my students. And I asked her why she had engaged. Right? Like, why did you show up today? And she told me this. This, this quote that I've been hanging out on to. She said, I don't want to miss out on revival because it's not what I expect. She saw that something was happening and she saw that God must be moving there. And she said, okay, I don't understand this, God. I don't even really know that I understand all the pieces, but I want to be here and I want to see what you're doing. And the thing is, is that I don't want to miss out on revival because it's not what I expect. It's not the people I expect. It's not the place I expect. It's not within my plans. I don't want to miss out on God's plans because I have it all figured out. So that's my invitation to you today. As we think upon David's story, and as we think of the things that we have good plans for, what do you do when God says no? And can you lay down your own perception, your own will, your own heart for God's? And you say, God, not my plans, but yours. Because when you say no, I know that you have something better planned. Let us pray. God, thank you that you are above all things. And that you hold us as imperfect people. And you recognize our hearts. And God, that you have plans that are better than we can imagine. Jesus, help us to follow you closely. To not be people who say, okay, I've done it all. But to be people who are hungering and thirsting for more of you. We pray all this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit in singing, Be Still, My Soul. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, ye faithful will remain. Be still soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful land. Be still, my soul, thy God doth undertake. God the future as he has the past. Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Still, my soul, though waves and winds still know, 
his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. Be still, my soul, the hour is hastening on when we shall be past all safe and blessed we shall meet at last to heaven see the Holy One eternal by symphonies of angel praise now strain to sound his glory come worship all before his grace the King in all his beauty. How worthy, how worthy, how worthy the King in all his beauty. Now see the King who wears a crown made of shame and splinters the symphonies is still in man the substitute for sinners as earth is stained with royal blood and quakes with love and fury he who breathes his last and bows his head the King in all his beauty. How worthy, how worthy, how worthy the King in all his beauty. Now see the Savior lifted up the Lamb who reigns in splendor, the hope of every tribe and tongue, His kingdom is forever. Bring praises and honor to His courts, bring wisdom, power, and blessing, for endless ages will adore the King in all His beauty. How worthy, how worthy, how worthy the King in all his beauty. How worthy, how worthy, how worthy the King in all his beauty. Almighty God, the one who created the world and everything in it, the one who came to die for you, 
the one who lives within you, loves you now and always, will never leave you or forsake you, and holds you tight as you leave this place. With a grateful heart, go in peace. Amen.